to anyone who is uh, watching this uh, later after uh, Friday, March 24th. Uh, we hope you too will be supportive. Go on our website at icujp.org uh, and uh, make a generous contribution. Uh -huh. um, so uh, Rick, if you would introduce our speaker. Sure. So um, as previously mentioned, um, Rose uh, brought the work of Dean Walbridge to our attention. And um, I think that that especially right now, it's it's very appropriate, obviously, as we get into um, getting close to Earth Day to be able to talk about these um, these issues. And we are getting to the point, obviously, where there's some pretty amazing climate changes in all parts of the world. So um, you know, it is time to have an ethical discussion of what our role is, what the responsibility of, of our elected officials is and how we go forward. So um, Dean Walworth wrote this really great book called uh, Earthling. And uh, the last word on your title, Dean, I'm going to actually ask you for the pronunciation, but it's a new ethics for the uh anthropocene is that right i usually just say anthropocene but anthropocene okay <laughs> i'm not quite sure where the stress accent actually goes on that word okay so um the dean is an attorney and executive director of advocates for the environment and it's a public interest law firm and environmental advocacy organization and in that um, capacity he's represented public interest groups such as the sierra club the Center for Bio Biological Diversity, and the California Native Plant Society in Environmental, Land Use, Water Law, and Open Government Litigation. And the legal, his legal practice focuses on reducing the impacts of climate change. And he's a graduate of the University of Arizona and Loyola. And as we were speaking before, everybody joined. He lives in uh, Shadow Hills near Sunland. And um, you know you can he, uh, you can read about Dean's dog and stuff, and he probably has his own <laughs> he probably has his own page. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dean, we're all um, thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to this presentation. Well, thank you, thank you, Rick. So um, Steve asked me to begin with a little info about myself. Um, and I won't go on too long about this, but kind of how I got into this world, this work. Uh, back in 2005, I was a, I've been a hiker for a long time and um, a member of the Sierra Club. And I was coming down from one of my hiking trails in the Verdugos near where I live. And I saw a sign saying that there was gonna be this huge housing project called Canyon Hills built in that canyon right along it's right along the 210 before you get to the Sunland exit and those of you who've driven it know it's like a beautiful stretch of kind of just chaparral hillside uh, and great pity so I thought this is not a good thing that they're going to put in all this housing stuff and I managed to get involved in the campaign um, I, I've been a software engineer for like 30 years and so I got involved in the campaign to fight this project, which got approved by the city of LA in 2005. But, you know, sort of parenthetically, um, it's come back, you know. Um, it got approved then and nothing's happened since, but they have a 20 year limit on the uh, development agreement. So they're pushing to get it built. And I'm, I'm now helping them fight it as an attorney this time. But that, case back in 2005 got me involved with the Sierra Club's conservation side. I'd just been a hiker before that. And what some of my fellow Sierra Clubbers told me was, hey, you know, if you have a campaign like that and you want to work on it as a volunteer, the Sierra Club will provide you all kinds of resources, you know, you as a volunteer. And as long as what you're doing fits within their program, you can kind of run it yourself. And um, so, so that's what I did. And I sort of worked my way up through the ranks of the Sierra Club um, and became chapter conservation chair for, for Angeles chapter, which covers LA, 
It's actually, in terms of members, the largest chapter in the country and it covers really? LA and Orange County. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of weird because, well, actually, I think it just got got bypassed a couple of years ago by the, you know, in all other states, chapters are state, you know, statewide. So there's a Atlantic chapter, which covers the state of New York. And I think they kind of passed us by in membership um, a while ago. Mm -hmm. But before that, it, it you know, had more members than anybody else. Kind of it was the biggest chapter. And we had a lot of campaigns running. And I really enjoyed kind of coordinating all those campaigns and running the, the, the meetings and all that. And I thought, isn't there some way I could do this for a living instead of um, writing software for Citibank and Chase, which is kind of what I was doing, um, help JP Morgan Chase make a little more money is the sort of bottom line of what I was contributing. So I thought about it and talked to some people and decided that the best way would be to go to law school. Um, and become an environmental attorney. So at the age of 57, I enrolled in Loyola wow. Law School and, um, you know, went through the program and be, became an attorney. Uh, I tried to get a job and, you know, I was not hired by any of the firms that I applied to. So I kind of hung out my shingle, but I knew enough people in the environmental community that, um, essentially, within one month after I got my law license, I was uh, doing a, a suit under the California Environmental Quality Act against uh, Vista Canyon Project up in near Santa Clarita. And, you know, I've had a pretty active process, uh, practice since then. Um, and lately, you know, so that was maybe a dozen years ago. And lately, it's evolved to the point where I really just do climate cases. Um, and, uh, you know, later on, if you're interested, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about CEQA and how, you know, how that works as a tool. But basically, none, I, I'm fighting warehouses primarily in the Inland Empire and forcing them to be net zero for GHGs, for greenhouse gases, by, you know, by suing them. And, um, you know, it's working pretty well. But that's kind of, at this point, the only kind of case I do. Uh, partly because it works reasonably well as a business and works really, it's pretty effective. You know, one nice thing about it is you actually uh, get GHG, you know, get greenhouse gas reductions. You get, you know, a concrete result rather than something kind of more pie in the sky that you could get out of other kinds of litigation. So that's sort of my journey on that um, side, on, on the professional side. In terms of this book, this Earthling book, I've always had kind of a more long-term perspective than a lot of people. And so in 1990, I started writing a book. I forget what the provisional title of it was, but it was kind of designed to be to come out in the year 2000 for, you know, because that's sort of a milestone, you know, you divide by, you know, every, every millennium there. Um, <coughs> actually, I think the book was intent, intended to be called Millennium. But the idea was to try to get people thinking a little more long-term about some of these problems uh, because we're, we tend to be short-term thinkers and some of them are gonna have long-term implications as we'll discuss in a little bit. So I kind of started that as a bunch of essays. And then when I, maybe three or four years ago, I started a column on Medium, which is sort of, I, I don't know, um, online blog, if you will. And it was about climate ethics. And I started working on the first chapter of this book and put out parts of it on Medium. And then I got a, um, an email from Ethics Press in Cambridge, UK, who said, hmm, would you send us a book proposal for this? So I sent them that first chapter and an outline and they you know, signed me up. Um, I doubt I'm gonna actually make any money off this thing. And one of the, one of the problems is, it, it's it's really expensive, you know. It it costs like ninety dollars to order a single copy of this, you know, little book. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not super huge um, from from Ethics Press in the UK. But um, anyway, it it's out. It's it came out pretty recently, um, and so so it's available now. But anyway, I'm I'm very glad to. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, that's that link in the chat 
chat is where you can order it if you're inclined to do so. So there's always sort of been, uh, let me talk a little bit about the sort of religious spiritual side and hope I don't offend you all too much by being, you know, one of the essays that I was working on a long time ago is called An, an Atheist on a Spiritual Quest, um, which is sort of <laughs> the way I see myself. Um, you know, you hear all these jokes about I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Uh, I'm, not, I'm never quite sure what that means. And you see it like in a movie or something. But um, my, my grandfather was a real estate developer in Ohio and Washington, D.C. And when he when his first wife died and he married this blue blood from Black East, who was a super Baptist, he gave it all up to become a Baptist preacher and moved to Glendale and set up this little church. Um, and that's the atmosphere in which my father grew up. Uh, he died. His father, my grandfather, who, who was the Baptist preacher, died relatively young. And my father's um, white mother's relatives all moved into her house in San Luis Obispo, um, and Ella and, and Agnes. And we, we were, when I was a kid, we were always hearing about like these four old ladies who were super Baptists with this poor kid who was just, you know, stuck with all these old ladies. And, um, but very, very kind of intensely religious. You know, he said one time he spent the Sunday in the afternoon at his mother's urging in the swing out in the back, waiting for Jesus to appear in the clouds. You know, he's, he's going to come today. Um, that, that's the way, the way they were thinking. He, in turn, um, went to Redlands, which was a very religious school back in the day, um, for his undergraduate, and then went to Berkeley to get a PhD in philosophy. Um, this, this experience obviously affected him a great deal, you know, this whole religion, religious hothouse he grew up in. Um, but he spent the whole rest of his life basically uh, on a journey from there to becoming kind of an agnostic. His, um, his main subject that he was interested in was the philosophy of Karl Jaspers, a German existentialist philosopher that he, you know, he went over and studied in Heidelberg with him for a year um, in like when Hitler was kind of young in power in like in 1935. Um, so he, he came back and had a career essentially writing books and articles about Gaspar's philosophy, you know, existential, German existential philosophy, which is somewhat different from French as existential philosophy like Sartre. Um, but anyway, he, you know, spent his whole life doing that and uh, kind of brought us up in a interreligious setting, if you will. We'd have Sundays where we'd look at, well, what is Hinduism like? Um, or, you know, when you get close to Christmas, he would like compare all the different gospel accounts of the birth of Christ and show how they were, you know, different and inconsistent and whatever. Um, but, you know, his whole life was really dominated by that early experience. And I, I feel like mine is a little colored by that whole thing, but it, um, it kind of gave me that I don't know if you will something of a spiritual orientation, which I which I think I bring to this book, but in sort of an ethical, moral, um, secular, you know, not not religious way. So enough about that. Um, Earthling, the book, this thing here, is essentially a, um, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a summary, it's a kind of a tour of the various aspects of climate change. And it has chapters on, the first chapter is on sort of climate ethics, which is what I'm gonna mostly discuss with you guys here. Uh, but, uh, but after that, there's a chapter on climate science, which is a fairly in-depth, I mean, high level summary, but still it gets a lot of stuff. Climate science, uh, sustainability, economics, law, politics, and a chapter about what we should do about the problem. Uh, so it, it covers all that stuff in a fairly quick way, uh, but it really does cover a lot of ground. So um, another thing I will just put in the chat real quick here is my Substack column, climateethics.net, um, which is a newsletter that comes out every maybe three weeks or so that you can just subscribe to for free. 
um, if you go onto that site and just say subscribe. Um, and it discusses a lot of these issues. It kind of builds on what's in the book and, and in some cases summarizes it. So I encourage you to sign up for that free, free subscription. Now this word, um, earthling, a new ethics for the Anthropocene. Um, Rick was talking about that a little bit, um, but I, I wanted to explain, you know, I, I feel bad about using a word. Practically everybody comes to me and says, what the hell is Anthropocene? I don't know. Um, no, but, but I kind of want to publicize the word a little bit because the concept is important. You know, geological, sci geological scientists um, divide the geologic past into epics and ages and things like that that I don't really understand, you know. But, um, but for instance, Jurassic epic was uh, between 201 and 145 million years ago. Um, and a lot of these are based on strata in the geologic sediment. You know, you got rocks down there and you can sort of see, well, it's, it's a little bit like tree rings, you know, at this point in the sediment, um, this happened and we know it's this many years ago. And the reason it looks like this, the reason there's a line there is because there was a lot of forest burning and it was soot and then got into the rocks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind Anthropocene is that we are making enough changes now. We humans, Anthropos is Greek for um, person, you know, and it's, it's actually non, you know, it's non-gender specific. It means man or woman. W would that we had a word like that in English. Um, but anyway, Anthropocene means people epic. You know, it's the time when humans are actually doing so much physically on the earth that we're going to be visible in the geologic strata because of our activities, mostly stuff from the industrial revolution. But it's kind of the human era, you know, and um, I, I think maybe industrial revolution is a good time, you know, sometime around the invention of the Siemens <laughs> engine is a good time to, to begin that. I use a lot of sources in the book, and I don't know if you've seen, there have been a couple articles recently about the IPCC report that just came out, but it's really important. Um, the place you can find it is, I'll, I'll type it in and maybe Rick will clean it up, um, ipcc.ch, except I get auto-corrected. <laughs> maybe, did that make it through? Yeah. So. Um, this is the scientific group. It's, it's hundreds of scientists that get together and, um, and do reports on climate change. And we're kind of at a lucky moment right now because the latest one has, the latest cycle has just finished. The prior cycle ended in 2014. So we're getting this like every nine years. <laughs> My guess is the next one is gonna be, you know, at least 10 years out. Um, so we're at a, at a moment where we have a really good um, summary of the, the state of the climate. And if you go to ipcc.ch, you will find um, the synthesis report listed there. And that is just maybe 80, no, did I write it down? Yeah, 85 pages, it's not too long. And it, it came out like two days ago and it's a great summary of kind of what's going on. It's pretty technical. And it's built on three reports that have been issued by, by working groups in the last um, couple of years. One working, um, well, the, the first one is physical science basis. The second working group one is um, climate adaptation. The third one is mitigation. And they're the thousands of pages long. I mean, they're, they're really technical, but they're also just summaries. You know, they're, they're summaries of thousands of scientific papers that are, that are listed there. Um, and it's the the report is approved by every government in the world, essentially, um, before it comes out. Every government, I mean, that's been a lot of problem with the process we've been hearing. Saudi Arabia goes in there and says, we don't want you to mention fossil fuels. You know, we, we want you to talk about reducing emissions, but, you know, the idea that we have to cut back burning gas and oil, I mean, that's terrible, you know, but they have a veto power over some of it. So it's a little bit... Um, on the conservative side, if you will, uh, and conservative in the sense of 
don't change the status quo. But that's that's a really good um, that's a good really good resource if you if you want a good summary of where we are kind of physically in the, on the climate, go look at that new synthesis report. My opinion is that this climate crisis is the most important issue humans have ever faced. I mean, for the first time, we have the acquired the ability to, to do significant harm to this planet, which will affect people, you know, future generations for a long time. And it's a long time because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's, that's mostly what's causing climate change, putting more CO2 in the atmosphere by burning um, gas and oil and coal. Um, that's, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a really long time, like hundreds to thousands of years. You know, probably 10,000 years from now, some of the CO2 we're putting in there will still be uh, circulating. So it takes a long time. You know, it's not like, oh, when, when we stop doing this, the bad stuff we're doing, it's all going to pop back to normal. No, 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 it's not. When we stop doing the bad stuff we're doing, that level of global warming is what we're stuck with for, you know, a thousand years at least. And so what we're doing is going to make the planet kind of worse for everybody to come during that period. The least reversible change, you know, even worse than just the consequences, which I'll get to, you know, at least summarizing in a minute of, of that increased uh, concentration of greenhouse gases. Uh, the worst consequence for me and the least reversible is species extinction. Um, the working group two report said that about one third of all plant and animal species could be extinct by 2070 if we keep going the way we are. And it takes like millions of years for species to come back. Um, you know, we see it after, we can see it in the fossil record after these, we've had maybe five big extinctions in the past. One of them caused by a meteor slamming into, a, um, into Yucatan and putting up you know, enough stuff in the atmosphere that it cooled everything off and you know, everything died. Um, we, we know how these extinctions work and we can look in the fossil record to see how long it takes for you know, different animals to evolve basically after we make the existing ones extinct. But it's, you know, it's a long time. You know, it's, it's unfathomable for humans because we're not used to thinking in terms of these, these long, long times. So millions of years to get back on that one. So a quick summary of, um, I just wanted to talk about the science for one paragraph here before we get into the ethics issues, just so everybody is on the same page sort of. Um, the basic method for that causes global heating is the greenhouse effect, which is um, when you increase these, these gases in the atmosphere, the concentrations, um, carbon dioxide and methane primarily, but there are a bunch of other ones that have less effect. Um, when you increase that concentration, it results in more heat. You know, you've got incoming radiation from the sun and then the earth radiates infrared back into space. And the CO2 and methane block that some of that infrared radiation and retained heat in the, you know, on earth driving up the temperature. That's, that's basically how it works. And the average temperature is very closely correlated with the concentrations. You know, both have been going up since 1950, um, concentrations in the air. And as long as we continue emitting GHG, greenhouse gases, GHGs, the temperature will keep increasing uh, and all the other effects. Um, when we stop, then we're stuck with that level of concentrations and effects for a really long time, you know, thousands of years. So it's not like when we stop, it goes away. It's like, we've got to stop because it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And some of the effects that, um, that result from this are heat waves. Um, you know, people, people die when the temperature is high enough and the humidity is high enough. And we've had some instances of that. You know, it's, it's called a wet bulb temperature, but 
Um, a really good novel about this is Kim Stanley Robinson's the, the Ministry for the Future, which begins with a heat wave in India. This is like near-term science fiction. So 20 years from now, a heat wave in India where 20 million people are killed because they don't have air conditioning there. You know, we can deal with this, right? We, you know, it gets too high here, I turn on my AC and that sort of takes care of the problem. But, you know, Indians are too poor for, you know, most of them to have air conditioning and they, they have a climate where it can get really hot and really humid. So it's pretty plausible that at some point, you know, you, you get, it, you get it, it being hot enough like 120 degrees with 70 degrees, you know, 80% humidity or something like that, a lot of them are going to die. And they, they don't have a way to prevent that. So heat waves, <laughs> we've seen increased storm frequencies, you know, not only hurricanes, but just rainstorms like Los yes. Angeles has seen a little rain lately. Um, and intensity, um, sea level rise, um, we're talking maybe several meters by the end of the century, which would totally devastate coastal communities, um, melting ice and glaciers, melting ice at the pole, poles like in the Arctic and Antarctic, floods and droughts and wildfires and greater spread of tropical diseases because the area that's warm where mosquitoes can live is being enlarged. So that, that'll be a big health impact to this. Sort of moving on to the ethics stuff, um, to me, an ethics focus is important. The usual focus for climate change is economic, right? I, I've had friends that say, why don't you just do a cost benefit analysis? You know, what are the, what are the costs that come from global warming and, and, uh, well, and, and what are the costs of dealing with it and what are the benefits of dealing with it? Um, and that's fine. You know, there's, there's a chapter in my book on the economics of this and, you know, the economics are pretty complicated and in, you know, the, but, and the analysis ends up helping figure out what to do, but there's so much that's left out, so much important stuff that's left out of an economic analysis, partly because some of the important things are not really economic things primarily, like the species loss, for example. How do you quantify the loss of, you know, some horned lizard in, in the Mojave Desert? You know, it goes extinct. That, that's a loss for everybody, really. Um, but how much is it worth? How do, you, how do you put it in economic terms? Uh, also, the, an economic analysis tends to minimize uh, impacts on the poor because they don't have much money. You know, if you, if you think about taking away a poor person, you know, half of that person's income, you know, it's, it's not going to turn out to be big dollar amounts, but it might be really important to them, you know, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Um, so I, I, I think the ethical framework is, is important as sort of a correction to the more usual economic framework. And the, the two major ethical issues I discuss in the, um, in the book are kind of inter, intergenerational um, and non-human animals, which uh, Rick kind of alluded to there at the beginning. So the intergenerational thing, the way the, the, the issue here is suppose we as is probably likely, end up at three and a half degrees centigrade of warming. Huge impacts. You know, all those things like the fires and the floods and the coastal rise and, you know, the sea level rise and all of those things, those will be much worse than they are now, you know, if we do that. And those effects will last for, you know, thousands of years. How many people will be affected by that? you know, in that thousands of years? Well, the answer is a lot more people than are affected right now. Um, you know, we're, we're giving birth to, I forget it's in the, in, the, in the book, but I think it's 140 million people a year. Um, so multiply that by a thousand years and you end up with 140, you know, billion people in, in the next, you know, coming out in the next thousand years. And this suggests that we should, you know, if you just do the math like that, you, you, we should, 
primarily consider their um, their interests. There are going to be so many more future people affected by this problem than are alive right now that you know anything that, that affects us is just trivial in the in the whole overall mix. Um, but I mean, there. So the economic version of this issue is is solved with something called discounting, and that gives. For instance, an economist would think, okay, all those costs stretching out in the future, we're going we're gonna to monetize them. We're going to say th this, this global heating is going to cost everybody $100 a year for, 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 for the future or some, some number like that. Um, it's usually actually expressed as a percentage of GDP, for, you know, gr gross domestic pro product. But we're going to like... A net present value analysis says, okay, we have this, this stream of costs, um, and how do we figure out what that adds up to, like, if we looked at it right now? And so the idea is, like, if you put $100 in the bank and got 5% interest, what would you have in 1,000 years? And it would be a lot. And so you take that and, and use the 5% rate, if you've got a stream like that, to figure out, well, what would the cost be now? Um, and the discount rate is really important when you're doing the economic analysis. If you have a high discount rate, it means we're expecting these impacts on the future to be not that much. You know, it's going to go down every year. Um, if you have a low discount, like if you do a zero discount rate, it's like what I was talking about. It's where you count the impacts on future people exactly the same as you count them on, on present people. So somehow we've, we, we can't really accept the conclusion that the future people are worth more, you know, than we are now, um, like a thousand times more, but we can accept that it's an important factor and maybe we should be considering the future impacts and giving them the same weight or something like that as we give to impacts on, on current people. But the problem is our, you know, our legal system doesn't take future people into account. Um, and most of our politics don't, you know, we're really short-term thinkers. So, you know, how do we deal with this? This is kind of a unique problem. I mean, most of the stuff we do is not gonna have effect on everybody in the world for a thousand years. Um, and so we need a new way to think about it. But I, I kind of wanted to open up at this point um, to what any comments you all might have or questions you might have about the sort of intergenerational, what's the fair, the fair thing to do for the people in the future for us to do right now. So let's open it up. Uh, Dean indicated earlier that he may do his talk in various sections, raising different ethical quandaries and challenges, and uh, rather than uh, holding the comments and uh, discussion till later. Uh, so I see Sophia's hand. It's funny, I just talked about this on the other day, interagencies. Um, the way CARB handles it in California is just wrong. Um, it's planned obsolescence when you have our polluters controlling the, the rulemaking. And um, I think the it has to be changed when you deal with regulations and certification that the lifespan of all these equipment, heavy duty machinery has to be the, the law, the rule, um, because you have these companies that will decertify and the carbon footprint um, to, to, for these massive machines, I mean, the ones that build bridges, all the trucks, everything. Um, you have Caterpillar and Cummings controlling, they're, they're making the rules and they decertify them after 12 years. What it costs us to build that machine, to then kill it, what it costs us to kill it, and it hasn't lived its lifespan. That is huge. And, and it's for profit because they want you to continue to purchase and purchase and purchase and decertify and decertify. And then you have a global monopolization of every industry because mom, pop, pop or, or smaller businesses have been monopolized by corporations that can do the upgrades. I really, really got into this when I was asked to represent five ports in California and, and study it not only from a 
how it impacts the consumer, the consumer that wants to purchase something that will last 50 years. And then looking what other countries do when it has to deal with the equipment or heavy duty machinery. And then the other thing is the hot fuel, what it does, the hot fuel is really important because it, they, they sort of water down the fuel so that it doesn't combust and it doesn't get its, um, uh, I know people want to get off fuel, but people are going to use it. It's part of, even the military is going to use it. So what do we do so that the, the oil companies, um, the mixture, we're not getting the full combustion of what's in our tank and it's causing these emissions. Those two things um, you know, can totally change our emissions. If, if we look at it, because I look at, you know, I studied this really for a long time um, because people's lives depend on it. Um, but when you have these Caterpillar and Cummings controlling the rules um, and the certification process, it's gonna cause more global warming. I just wanted to share that with you because it's been something um, that's important, not even to California, if I speak to California, even the grants that were given out to upgrade, whether it be a small organic farm, um, not being able to, to do the upgrades and, and the factory farms taking it over because they can. You have to be decertified and you just spent 100000 or $200,000 on equipment and you can't upgrade. Those grants were given to corporations outside of California. And I think it, yeah. in, 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 and I just want to finish by saying that it's also causing the, the people at the bottom the worst impact because they cannot upgrade. They don't have the resources and their jobs are obliterated. And so you can't survive if you can't feed your family. And so there's a lot of levels, even economics, those dollars that went to California, out of California, if they would have been deposited in our bank, say you want to purchase a machine for 100,000 and you got that grant, those monthly deposits on the loan could have gone to the, the financial infrastructure that would have given other smaller loans out uh, to all our local businesses in California. So it's just not just looking at it from, economics matters too in all this, how we self-sustain ourselves when yes. corporations are taking our funds to, to take advantage of it. And I know I'm sharing a lot, but you know, I don't know what you, if you have any thoughts on it. Thank you. Dean, some thoughts on those ideas? Well, um, I, I think I agree pretty much with, with Sophie, at least on a lot of it. One of the problems we have, well, there, there are two things. By continuing to allow um, fossil fuel infrastructure to be constructed, um, we are kind of on the path to locking in uh, its use for longer. The, you know, the problem is, you know, when you build something like a pipeline, you, you know, in, in terms of accounting, you, um, what's the word? You depreciate it. You know, you, you put it on as, as an investment and it's not an expense, right? When you build it, all the, all the millions of dollars that you spend building it, but every year that you use it, you take an, a depreciation, which is the expense. If halfway through that process, you decide to abandon it, then all of a sudden you've got an accounting entry for the, the remaining portion of that depreciation, which is maybe if you're abandoning it halfway through, you know, it's like a third or a quarter of the value of the thing that you just have to write off right then. That's this huge expense. And companies do not like to do that. So they try to keep using these things they've built. Um, and we're right now supposedly not permitting oil in California, oil wells within 3,500 feet of schools and um, residences. And that, of course, that new law is being challenged on, on an initiative or, probably, or a referendum in the next, next election by the oil companies. But, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do that, but we're not, you know, not, maybe not enforcing that well enough in California. And, um, you know, it's not enough. What we really should do is ban the, you know, have a, a law, a statute that says we're going to phase out fossil fuel production by 2050. Um, and we're going to do it, you know, sort of in some specific way, like a linear ramp down. We're not going to issue any more permits for any more wells. We're going to get rid of the ones that we already have um, by then. And uh, but but, you know, the political will to do that is 
you know, just isn't there. But just one more add on thing before I uh, turn the floor back, which is the latest IPCC report says that financial flows, quote unquote, um, and I'll just take that to mean kind of money in general or subsidies, financial flows to fossil fuel interests are larger in the world than fossil financial flows to renewable energy. We're still subsidizing fossil fuel use. You know, governments are giving money to, you know, Exxon and such like that to do oil exploration. And it's in the IRA. Um, you, know, you know, that that has to stop too. Thank you. Uh, you've triggered uh, six hands or raised, so we'll go right hey, through good. them. Uh, Sophia, take yours down so I can keep track. Uh, Rick Bignales. Um Thank you for, for asking the question, Dean, about, um, you know, the essentially the responsibility of future generations. And um, I wanted to see what you thought about the analysis that's been happening, where um, the uh, uh, the idea that the raising the raising of um, mean temperatures on the planet is a impetus for other life forms on this planet to evolve and and you know, to you know, to evolve to to survive into that um higher temperature and um what we're looking at in that respect is uh, you're looking at uh you know things like crops moving from one area to the other uh uh, uh major um sources of income for ma for countries not being able to sustain themselves anymore because they just don't thrive in the in that environment and conversely things that you maybe don't want to thrive in a certain environment like certain fungi and stuff if they evolve i mean the the idea that a fungi will evolve because of a higher temperature and be able to live in other creatures is what that show the last of us is all about right so it's not like um it, it's it's not like if it happens it would be new to us <laughs> there's actually been uh, uh you know people have been actually been able to play a game trying to get out of it so um i just want to get your idea about how climate change not only affects um the uh uh, uh a animals on this planet and and including humans but other life uh on this planet as well okay well that's a really good <laughs> question um the ev evolution is a pretty slow process just by itself you know it's you know, you have a random mutation that might make the, you know, the, the animal who's mutated more um, adapted to its current circumstances and that therefore the animal su survives where others, you know, and now competes others that don't have that mutation. But that, that process, you know, takes a lot longer than say, you know, breeding a new kind of dog, which, you know, has the same effect you know, if I want to make a little bitty dog, I can I can do it by, um, you know, breeding dogs and choosing the smallest ones and you know propagating those and not the others. And I can do that within a hundred years. Um, but for for the natural selection, where it's not, you know, it's random changes and it's random changes that don't happen very much. Like you know, a cosmic ray hits your DNA um, right right at the moment before um, you reproduce. Um, so it goes pretty slowly. And, you, you know, a lot of the problem in general with climate change is that we're not used to the timescales involved. You know, when I talk about these geologic timescales that go back, you know, billions of years, um, that's just not anything that is in our experience. We're used to, you know, five years, 10 years. Um, and it's, it's a little bit like money. I mean, you know, a billion dollars seems like a million dollars, but it's, you know, really different. Um, so the, the problem we're seeing with sp for species loss, you know, it's different for plants and animals somewhat, but in both cases, 
is as the temperature goes up, what they'd like to do is move into a an ecosystem that's like their old one, the one that they grew up in, the one that they're used to, the one where they thrived. So sometimes they can. I mean, like in the mountains, some animal, like a fox or something, can just move up, you know, move up the mountain. Uh, as it gets warmer, you move to a slightly colder place and you're, you're fine, you're, you're there, you're back. But there are a lot of barriers to those movements. You know, it's not like everybody has a mountain to move up. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times the migration paths that would save these animals are blocked by, by development or, you know, there's the Mojave Desert and the fox can't live there and get across to the Sierras from the, the San Gabriels or something like that. So, you know, the, the Sierra Club used to have this um, I, idea called uh, adaptable habitats or something like that, where the club would try to facilitate this movement by, by doing like land use planning, make sure this wildlife corridor doesn't get blocked because this kind of animal will benefit from that corridor. Um, that's kind of gone by the by because there's just too many of these problems. You know, each, you know, you've got the same thing with plants too. I mean, they can move a little bit, you know, they can drop their seeds over another hundred meters and they get blown in the wind, you know, and then they grow up there and they sort of try that new spot, but they can't move very fast. They're not like the animals. So the, it's a kind of a, even a bigger problem for them as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that species loss thing is is easy to solve, um, and there there is a huge impact indeed on on all kinds of plants and animals. And it's going to oh, and and also Rick, you brought up crops. Most there, there are analyses in these IPCC reports about um, how climate check change, climate change will affect agricultural production, and most cases. A degree or two is sort of beneficial. You know, you a little more carbon dioxide is probably beneficial for growing plants too. But the overall impact, you know, and it also varies a lot by by region. When when you when you have a map of the world about what are the costs going to be for climate change for each country, you see the costs are negative for Russia and Canada. Um, you know, those places are cold. You know, it's it's good for them to warm up, right? Um, they they can grow more pro crops if everything's a degree or two, you know, warmer. But for most of us, no. I mean, there are a lot of places that are too hot, and we're going to lose a lot of agricultural productivity um, in those those sort of hotter places. And you know, overall, it's it's not good for agricultural production. Thank you. Uh, before I make my comment as facilitator. Uh, Fair warning, Jasmine, we will turn to your reflection uh, just after the end of the presentation, if that's okay, okay. with you. Yes, that's fine. Sorry, I'm it's sorry for that. that was no really problem. Good. I didn't want to lose the, the flow now because so many people are engaged. But I also want uh, Dean to know the additional people that he's speaking with. So I'm going to run uh, through folks who have joined us. If you'll briefly uh, introduce yourselves, and I'm uh, thrilled to see Daniel Tam uh, back with us. Welcome, Daniel. Briefly introduce yourself. Come off mute. Uh, I am uh, uh, now the Reverend Daniel Tam, uh, a deacon in the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, um, um, uh, still and even more deeply now immersed in uh, climate action, climate justice, and housing justice as well. I'm also chair of Interfaith Solidarity Network, and I'm delighted to be here. Great. Uh, Daniel, I still have the same email. Why don't you reach out to me because you're you're involved in a variety of things and, and we may want to uh, bring you by for an update in a future program. For sure. Uh, and I'm on the Bishop's Commission on Climate Change. So um, it sort of dovetailed with what we're doing this morning. Sorry Excellent. I was late. I was working actually on a uh, uh, what the next um, series of spiritual practices is going to be. And it's... Uh, going to be on sacred soul, sacred earth, um, which is all about this. 
<laughs> Excellent. Uh, so you've you've gone from the profane to the sacred in your uh, career, Daniel, leaving leaving government and going to where you are. It's all one. That's a good answer. Anna Buell. Hi, really happy to be here. This is this is my hope for the future is ethics and spirituality connecting us with the earth that we are part of. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ruby, just introduce yourself and then in a moment I'll call on you. Happy birthday. Thank you. And um, I'm a religious scientist and I tell you, the speaker this morning is right in accord with me in my life. So um, I'm also a board member here at ICUJP. I'm with um, the uh, Church of Religious Science. I'm with uh, Agape and with um, um, Ceasefire, which is the group also regarding work. We work with the city. And um, I have no toy guns, so <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> it's my email. It's Thank bullet you, through my mind. <laughs> so, Dean, your ethical question is, should we care about future generations? Uh, this group knows that uh, when I practiced law, I was a constitutional lawyer. So I often think of things uh, through the Constitution, and, and you're a lawyer, Dean, uh, listen to the closing words of the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, which says that we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Uh, the Constitution has a lot to apologize for uh, in terms of perpetuating slavery and, and other flaws. But in this respect, the founders understood that we do have a duty to our posterity. So I think your argument is very well taken. And uh, separate from all this up here in Sonoma County, we have some redwood trees on our property. And I have instinctively and, and voluntarily said to friends that we are the trustees of these redwoods. You, you can't own a redwood tree. You care for it, you tend to it, you keep it alive and healthy, but it's gonna be here hopefully for our posterity. So I don't know if that perspective uh, adds anything to your thoughts, Dean. No, thank you for that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing about kind of the, you know, everybody's sort of religious spiritual bases or moral for this intergenerational issue, uh, you know, how much should they be taken into account in our ethical decisions right now? And, you know, th those are good factors. We have, we have four hands up, uh, Dr. Ruby. There I go. Hey, um, I tell you, you're on the same page as me. Um, even though you went to Loyola Law School, I went to Loyola, the regular school, and that's when I had to change to study religion. I was Catholic, and um, then they make you study all the religions, and I re realized everything was truth, everything was one, and that's when I became a religious scientist, to know truth is truth, but the big thing is, you know, with my birthday and everything, and being with children is, for, for me, the importance is um, our re-education of the children. We keep talking about the past and the future. I mean, the past and and uh, you ask the children what their favorite subject is. It, it's like math or English or, or history. It's not what's going forward. It's not scientists. 
you know, and science is not just spaceships, but it's our land, like everything you've expressed. So I feel like, um, you know, and, and when you were speaking about, um, uh, we got Daniel on with sacred earth and, and you were talking about the, the temperatures, the mountains, the deserts, the peaches, the, the beaches, well, animals, these are things that came to my mind while you were speaking. We've got to re-educate the teachers to, te to let them know it's our planet future. It's the earth. You know, what, what is it that we can do to, t to give them interest in, in um, everything, you know, but, but, you know, and what we can do, not just history or English or math, math and English, are, they're, they're in everything you know, in every, every subject. But what is it that we can do to start the children to say, well, hey, it's the earth. You know, it's important. Are you interested in um, uh, the temperature, what's happening with, with the earth now, the changes? With the, are you interested in uh, climbing or the mountain? Are you interested in, in what's happening with plastic and, and, and how can we redo this? So I think it, it's a whole way of new thing it's you know we talk about the teachers you know yes they need more money but yes they need a re-education of teaching and I'm talking about from kindergarten because some of the pe children I was talking with last night with your mind are, are kindergarten and I asked them you know well, what do you think about school so that for me is the future and and that's a way of saving this planet Dean yeah, well, that's a really important comment. I mean, we do have to um, educate young people, and you know, most just sort of looking around this this group, it looks like most of you, not all of you, are kind of like my age, like old. And one of the one of the issues for <laughs> Excuse me, excuse me, in my, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that, but um, you you can apply it to yourself if you like. Um, I didn't say everybody was. Um, but how do you hand over this stuff to the younger generation? I mean, not, not only the, for me, it's like the younger lawyers, you know, I have some knowledge about how to do these kinds of cases. And I kind of want to realize that I'm going to be bowing out at some point before too long. And we want to get new ones in to take over and be really effective and, and, and not, and not put up barriers to them, but it's just as important for kids um, to, to have that education, uh, you know, going back as far as they possibly can. But, you know, I, I know more about educating lawyers than I do about educating, you know, kindergartners. So I won't say more. Thank you. I'm going to call on Anthony. Uh, take down I just your. Want to say, it's not Go just ahead. kindergartners, but it's teachers. We oh, have yeah. To really educate them, you know, to, to be able to teach, to, to make the children excited about science about everything you're speaking about. So that's what I was talking about. Well, it's a good thing we're in California and not Florida. You probably wouldn't be allowed to mention climate change in, in any kind of class there. But I hope we can get yes. into our curriculum. Uh, if I can uh, enhance Ruby's point, isn't science itself uh, mm -hmm. under attack? I mean, I think that's what you alluded to a moment ago. Oh. So. So to reach climate change, you also have to uh, recognize and respect science uh, in, in the broadest sense. Dean. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the larger category, of course, is truth. Um, there, there's a lot of, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of steps back in the last 10 years in terms of um, untruths being given uh, like social currency uh, in certain political contexts. And, you know, it used to be that the, whether something was true or not was actually important to a lot of people. And now it, it, it sort of doesn't matter. People just choose their, um, choose their facts, not based on truth, but b based on kind of their political, their politics and what they want, they want to happen. So science is part of that. I mean, those people don't expect, respect science partly because they don't respect truth. And, and you're right. And, and another point is the US is falling behind in science education. You know, there, there are more, you know, Koreans and Chinese and such um, 
doing better on tests than most of our our high school students, and and that's that's a real shame. Thank you, uh, Anthony. You had your hand up before. Yeah, I'm still uh, waiting. <laughs> Please go right ahead. Okay, so I want to thank you, Dean. I I really appreciate uh, the ethical issues you're raising. I was reminded of <clears throat> a saying that I think most of us know from the indigenous wisdom. You know, think about the next seven generations as you make your plans, and we tend to think as Westerners just of the next quarter and how it's going to be profitable <laughs> or not. But um, my my interest uh, has been in affordable housing. And uh, so I've really put a lot of uh, thought to uh, urban planning and all of that, which has a huge impact on the environment. One of the big problems in, in is that uh, so many cities are, are have most of their cities zoned for single family homes. They're very energy inefficient. Um, they they uh, uh, lead to urban sprawl and uh, and it just in, in so many ways they are problematic when it comes to the environment and yet elected officials see them as sacred <clears throat> you know and need to be protected. Um, I, and I, I have to say one of the things that I'm proud of of Pasadena is we just uh, passed an ordinance that would uh, that we're going to be a, a fossil fuel free as a city uh, by. 2030. So that that took a huge amount of political uh, uh, campaigning on the part of the environmentalists in our city it was successful. Um, but one of the issues that I, I just wanted to lift up is the misuse of CEQA. Uh, CEQA can be very good in many respects. Uh, there are housing projects that are not good for the environment. But frequently when affordable housing projects are pers uh, are uh, proposed in the city, CEQA sometimes is evoked to, to scuttle the project, and, and sometimes to absurd extent. Just uh, recently up in uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, they were using CEQA to stop uh, dormitories from being built because it would generate noise pollution. Uh, students partying would be uh, disruptive to the neighbors, so they they wanted to use CEQA to, to kill that project. So I, I wonder if you have given some thought to um, to this question of of the use and misuse of CEQA from a from an environmental ethics standpoint. And again, I'm with you when it comes to projects that are in areas that uh, where 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 it would be harmful to the environment. But I'm talking about the use of CEQA in an urban context uh, to stifle affordable housing and uh, just housing in general. And as you answered, Dean, uh, define CEQA. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. The CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. And what it requires is that before a public agency like a state agency or a city or a county approves a project that may have significant impact on the environment, that it prepare a, an environmental document analyzing what those impacts will be. And that's either an environmental impact report, an EIR, or if there will be no significant impacts and a mitigated ne negative declaration. It's a fairly technical area of law, but it's the one where I practice. My practice is like almost all CEQA. I mostly sue over warehouses. You know, I try to stay away from, from housing projects, um, but the Number of, so, so the way it works is if the EIR or MND is inadequate, like it doesn't do a good analysis of something, or, I mean, there are a whole, you know, raft of ways that, that an EIR can be inadequate, but one of them is you're, you're requiring mitigation measures that will not be effective. For example, you know, you, you say, well, we're going to mitigate the effect of this impact back down to the point where it doesn't matter anymore by doing this, but the this is, you know, you can show it's not gonna work. Um, it's, so, so CEQA is, deals with flaws like that in the environmental analysis and not the quality of the product, the project. So for instance, in the Berkeley case, the issue was not that the project will make too much noise. It was that the EIR didn't adequately analyze the noise that the project would make. So what they have to do is go back and redo the EIR to get back, you know, to get past that. Um, 
but uh, a lot of times, you know, the uh, a lot of times project proponents don't actually redo it once they they lose their first CEQA case. But you know, there's a lot of talk. Well, let's see, two more things here. One is a very small percentage of projects are litigated under CEQA. That could be something like two percent. Um, and and there is some abuse. You know, it can be abused by people who, you know, you. I, I had one case that was offered to me a couple of years ago. It's like these guys um, in on the west side somewhere who lived in you know, houses on this nice street didn't want an apartment building, you know, at the end of the block. Uh, there, there was a, a proposal to that was approved by the city to build, you know, 15, uh, 15 apartment units there, and. They said, "Well, we we don't like it. Um, we we want to use CEQA to fight it." And I said, "Well, go find another lawyer. I don't, you know, I don't want to work on on that kind of a case." Uh, so, th in my opinion, that would have been an abuse of just just trying to use the environmental laws to stop a kind of normal. There's nothing wrong with it. Project that is actually not going to have much environmental impact. Uh, and but but I think that's the minority. That, that happens like that. Affordable housing, there, there's been a lot of talk. You know, I'm, I'm on these lawyers groups that um, essentially sequel lawyers like me, um, but on the petitioner side, um, that talk about this. And also within the sort of housing community, there's a lot of pushback on some of the measures. There's a lot of debate on a lot of Scott Wiener's stuff that, you know, like SB9 and SB10 that allow uh, multiple units on every single family lot. Um, th there are new, there's a the Housing Accountability Act um, makes, it, makes it much harder to actually challenge affordable housing uh, projects. And, and you know, the, the state is definitely pushing on relaxing these restrictions uh, on, on, on housing, but you know, it's not all CEQA. Is CEQA is not the only thing. I think it's really hard financially for um, people to build affordable housing. You know, like, you know, if you can build market rate housing or affordable housing in the same place, you tend to build market rate housing because you, you know, you, the units are worth a lot more. Um, and you know, that that's one of the big the big problems. But um, I. And then let me touch on that, that the, the issue you began with, um, Anthony, which is um, urban planning. And I, I totally agree. You know, um, just, there's a, a little section in the book, in my book on land use planning um, in terms of sustainability. And it points out that an additional two and a half billion people will live in cities in 2050, um, you know, compared to now. And you know, mostly the increase will be in Africa and Asia, but um, land, land use planning, I mean, LA is a very special case, right? I mean, the normal city is more like Paris or Chicago or um, San Francisco. Um, LA is kind of a spread out car town and how we, we need to evolve to get, I totally agree, get rid of single, single family zoning. What we want is walkable neighborhoods with high density, close to transit, um, you know, that, that'll save, that'll help with climate change a lot. You know, if, if we can do that instead of driving everywhere, uh, we can walk, you know, there's that 15 minute walk thing um, that they're talking about you know, implementing in Paris where everything you need is within a 15 minute walk or transit ride from your house for everybody in the city. Um, that, that's where we need to get, but how do we get there? It's very, you know, it's very difficult. Um, I, th I, I believe the Los Angeles uh, planning department, city planning, is trying to adopt those. There's like a whole new um, downtown plan that's a lot more um, kind of new, new urbanism, if you will, than than single family house. I think they're trying to move in that direction, but it's hard. You know, there there, there are a lot of uh, there's a huge political um, pushback. You know, all these people who own single family houses that are most of their net worth don't want apartment buildings anywhere near because they're, they're worried that it's gonna degrade their quality of life and degrade um, their property values. And so these changes have a, a big pushback, but I kind of agree with you, they, they need to be made. Thank you.
Uh, we've Thank got you. three. <clears throat> we've got three hands up. Uh, Carol Francis. Yes. Um, echoing what Anthony said about your question about um, what do we feel about the next generations? Just want to say yes with the Iroquois. Uh, looking towards how it affects on the seventh generation is part of my religion. Um, could you speak on uh, war as an environmental <laughs> catastrophe? <clears throat> oh boy, now you're, you're catching me by unawares here. I hadn't, hadn't really thought about it. I mean, obviously really bad. I mean, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, I mean, that, that, that's like an environmental disaster over there with everybody killing uh, everybody. Iraq, and... Afghanistan. Yeah, and, right. and just the use of, it's not only what gets bombed, but the use of water and fossil fuels and such by the military. Yeah. You know, that, that in general is not something I've, I've never really seen a good analysis. But I'm Not that I've looked for it, but you know, how much fossil fuels do, do the military use? What are their plans for um, dealing with global warming? And can they, can they get to net zero? Uh, I think it's going to be pretty hard. You know, they're, they're going to have to like redo all their hardware, um, which would obviously Stop. be pretty expensive. Um, and, you know, airplanes, airplanes in general have difficulties with that. I mean, the only solution nobody's talking about an electric airplane, you know, like an EV for the sky. Um, the, the, the best solution I've heard of right now is sort of some sort of biomass thing where you, you know, you grow some plant for, and make ethanol that comes out to be airplane fuel, which then gets burned and gets back into the atmosphere, but then you grow more plants and they absorb that carbon dioxide. You can do that mm -hmm. whole cycle in a way that is, you know, not, you know, doesn't result in any net emissions, uh, but it takes a lot of land and a lot of resources, you know, probably takes food out of people's mouths when you're, when you're using the land for that instead of, instead of growing food. But, you know, there's another war related thing that it's probably going to be hard to fix is, you know, airplanes. Maybe not have as many wars. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that goes through my mind is, is there some way we could have a world without violence in general? I mean, that, that would be really great. <laughs> The motto of ICUJP is religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. So mm -hmm. it's very much at stake for us. Yeah. Moving on to Phil Wegg. Hi, okay. A uh, couple of things. The, the, the most recent part of the conversation here about housing and development uh, just brought to mind, can you... Um, Tell us what you know about whether environmental impact reports are now including um, climate uh, effects. Uh, um, environmental impact reports have been around for a very long time, and it uh, occurs to me that they're really not taking that job seriously with respect to climate. So you'd like to see a comment on that. And, and Secondly, I just stumbled across this book. Uh, you see it is in, in it is in it's it's in reverse printing, I think. The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg. Um, it's I think it's just out of the press. She's edited this huge 450-page book of essays and writings about climate that looks to be extremely comprehensive. I haven't gotten into it yet. I've just gotten into the table of contents. <laughs> uh, and uh, just to give you a, a, a taste, uh, a quote that I just pulled out random at a chapter heading, the climate crisis cannot be solved within today's systems, but that must not stop us from taking whatever action we can now. Um, anyway, uh, I'm what, so my second question is, are you aware of this book and do you have any comments about it? Okay, thanks. 
I'll, I'll do your two questions. Well, actually, I'll ask. I'll answer about the book first, and then I'll go back to, to the secret question. Um, I just got that book. Like I think it came out pretty recently, um, and I, I got it like two or three days ago. So I've just started reading it myself, and okay. it is. It looks like a really great resource. I mean, it's, but it's hundreds of little essays, like little one and two page and three page mm -hmm. contributions from lots of different people, which is kind of nice. You know, you get, a, you, you get a whole bunch of different viewpoints on, on everything. Um, I, I would suggest that it's probably not nearly as comprehensive as my book because it focuses on uh, kind of a subset of the topics. You know, it, it's not primarily about ethics. It's, it, it, you know, it's not gonna do a deep dive on economics um, and, and, and law also. You know, there's a, a chapter I've got on, on law, but, you know, to me, it's it's kind of a complementary thing to my book. Like, it has a whole bunch of different viewpoints. One of the strengths or weaknesses of Earthling, my book, is that it's all my point of view, and it's it's pretty strongly imbued with my, you know, my personality and my my way of seeing things. And you know, there are a lot of other a lot of points on which people disagree with me, and you know, so you kind of get more of a broad perspective from Greta Thun Thunberg's book. And of course she'll sell, you know, a thousand times as many copies because she's got a great name, but it, it does look like a very good book. And so, you know, I, I would recommend it to everyone. As far as CEQA covering um, climate, it does. Um, there was a change in the guidelines a few years ago. Um, the, the guidelines being the CEQA guidelines put out by the Office of OPR, Office of Professional, I forget what it stands for, but it's it's a regulator in California that's charged with kind of doing um, regulations for CEQA kind of under the statute. And those regulations have the force of law. And, the, and it, it kind of requires now analysis of greenhouse gas impacts from projects. And in fact, that's what I sue over. You know, I'm, I'm probably the, CEQA GHG, um, I, I bet I've done more of those suits than any other attorney in California. Um, it, it basically requires that projects disclose their um, GHG impacts and, and analyze them. And, you know, it's kind of a complicated thing. They can analyze them in, you know, the CEQA works by thresholds of significance. And is it significant or not is the key, is the key question when you're looking at an EIR. Um, and they have all kinds of tricks to make them not significant because they don't want to, if they're significant, then they have to do all feasible mitigation. And that's, that's basically the, what, what I do in my lawsuits is say, hey, you know, this is significant, therefore you have to do all feasible mitigation, which means do everything you can on the project site and then buy offsets after that or some kind of credits. Um, but, but indeed, they do have to um, analyze their, their emissions and decide whether they're significant. And that's a, that's a valuable thing to, to sue over. And what, by the way, what I usually end up doing is settling these cases. You know, once I, once I file a lawsuit against a warehouse project, I just settled one yesterday. You know, it's like they don't want the delay in, in the project and they're willing to come back and say, okay, we'll do some GHG mitigation. Um, and we, we settle and dismiss the lawsuit. So it's a really good tool, you know. Thank you. Rose. Tell us if I unmute. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really picking up from other people. I just want to kind of say to Ruby, in my experience, young people are much more aware of climate change than older people are. I mean, the fact that we're mostly old people on this is because we're the people who have the time on a Friday morning. <laughs> but um, I mean, and teachers are very aware of it, Ruby. I mean, really, I mean, they teach it all the time. It's, it's very strong. I mean, it's all part of what um, our wonderful friend in Florida is kind of campaigning against now, isn't it? It's kind of like schools shouldn't teach things with what's the three letters, ESD or something. On them, so I think young people—they're they're impotent because they don't have the positions of power yet, but they're definitely there. I mean, I know young people who refuse to ever get on an airplane, and so they will never go anywhere on a plane because they're so worried about climate change. Anyway, that's just my little thing on young people. Um, CEQA—I just wanted to mention that too, 
because, I mean, I think you've covered it all, but I just want to tell you that I was involved in a sequel thing in the northeast of the valley, which was a virgin area, really good habitat for birds and animals and everything else that we have here, including mountain lions. And um, there was a poss possibility of building this estate of extremely rich, large houses there and completely ruining the environment. And I was one of the people involved and we managed to get that one squashed on CEQA and the planning commission was refused. But the other side of that was just after that, I was the president at that time of the society. Um, I got quite viciously attacked by people from a poorer part of, well, Pacoima, um, because they interpreted it that I was opposed to affordable housing in their area, and that was going to affect the, young, the, uh, the poor people that they dealt with. So I just thought that was kind of interesting that I got both within six months of each other. Anyway, thank you, Dean. I'm really glad that I suggested you. <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> well, know thank you, you. Lived locally at all. I had no idea when I saw your email. Oh, <laughs> it was okay. Quite a surprise. Huh. Yeah. No, that's great. So, Dean, uh, and if uh, Rose and Carol Francis will take down their hands, oh. uh, Dean, do you want to develop any further uh, ethical questions? We've covered a lot of ground, but uh, please sure. continue. Sure. Remind me again what time we're how much more time we have for this uh, part? We, you should finish by about 9.15 so we can do the reflection and some closing items. Okay, so another 10 minutes or so. Right. The other, the, the second kind of moral question on my list um, goes back to uh, what Rick raised, which is kind of what's the moral standing of animals, non-human animals? You know, most, most of our systems, you know, like like as a lawyer, they're property, right? They're like a brick. You know, you can you can take one, you can torture it. You know, it has no, it can't sue you for maltreating it or anything like that. It has no no standing at all in the legal system. You you can't bring a lawsuit on behalf of an animal, and uh, you know, and it has no rights. I I kind of submit that. A lot of religions are sort of like that. You know, it's like people have souls and animals don't. So they're in a totally different category. Um, the one that obviously is not like that is Buddhism, where there's this idea of reincarnation that, you know, your dog can come back as a person in the next life. Um, you know, same soul sort of continues living, if you will. Uh, but, I mean, we don't need to decide that soul thing, but there's sort of a general more general issue of are animals kind of part of the moral system? Do, do, do we have to, you know, feel bad about our, our impacts on them when we, when we hurt them? Um, is that like a moral harm? And do they have interests and rights that we as kind of the stewards of creation, you might call it, should be protecting, you know, or are they just instrumental? Are they, you know, like you, you own a horse so you can go to the market on your horse um, or you own a dog so that it protects your problem. Are, are they here to serve our needs? We, we raise chickens so we can kill them and eat them. Um, these are all kind of instrumental things where the, the animals help humans or, or serve humans, if you will. But I kind of feel like um, because they're alive, you know, a, a lot of the, the basis for kind of my ethical system that I put out in the book is just a reverence for life. You know, life, this life on earth is kind of a miracle that, you know, may not exist anywhere else. You know, it's, there's a, you know, it's called the Fermi, Fermi par paradox of we don't, um, you know, there's a very small percentage of chance of life arising on a, on a planet somewhere. Um, we think, you know, we, we kind of have an idea about how life arose here. And there are so many of those planets. So you multiply a really small number um, of what's the chance of life arising on a particular planet by this huge number of planets, but you have no idea. Right mm -hmm. now, we don't know. You know, there could be like millions of planets with intelligent beings out there, um, or there could be none. I mean, that's quite a possibility. If the answer is none, if we're the only game in town, if we're the only planet in the world with life, then we're really, really special. And, you know, that life is really, really important. And 
you know, otherwise the universe is just kind of a, a big machine with planets revolving around, you know, other planets and galaxies that revolve around, you know, but, but, you know, a cold, empty machine, if you will. So coming from that and saying, well, this life is really valuable and really important. Shouldn't I extend that to my dog? You know, you know, he's living, he's experiencing things. He can get hurt. Um, isn't his pain, isn't his life something that counts in a sort of an ethical sense? Shouldn't I be looking out for him? Shouldn't we all be looking out for all the animals, you know, on the, on the planet? Um, but how does it enter into this moral and eth ethical thing? Um, you know, different religions will probably see it different ways. But anyway, that that yeah. is... The other issue. Good. You've raised that very sharply, and we have two responses. I'm going to take both of them, and then you can comment on those. Uh, Rick. So um, I, I think that's an interesting question, Dean. I do think, and I, I've just recently come to this idea, that the idea of evolution is more than anything else. It's the idea of leaving as small a footprint on the earth uh as you can and um our our evolution has reflected that where um we become more efficient as far as farming we um we try not to create as as many conflicts and wars because of the devastation that happens afterwards um we try not to use weapons that uh, will generate a lot of destruction because of the aftermath. Uh, and, and I think um, one of the aspects of that is also evolving into a, into a community that is more um, uh, kind to animals and, and uses them less for food and, and for, uh, uh for work as such and you know um who know if we become as efficient as the earth and using something like photosynthesis then th there is a possibility of never having to use fossil fuels anymore so um i i think that's part of our science and part of our evolution and and also part of our moral quest to a certain extent sophia Oh, thank you for your comments, Rick. I really um, as a realist and the, the, the things that I about what's going. Um, there's a out of Canada, but there's a group called the Wrong Kind of Green, and I think that's why there's so much pushback because of the hustle behind the hustles and and so many bad actors to involved. So I'm going to put the link in there because there's a whole piece on the manufacturing of Greta Greenberg and this is not a politics involved. I just think we should be aware of it. So I'll put the link in the chat, um, but good work. I appreciated today's presentation because I think all of us want to protect, you know, Mother Earth. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, this is a commentary period. So I'm going to take Carol Francis and Anthony. Okay. Um Yes, you mentioned Buddhism as a religion that respects animals. All the indigenous religions of the Americas. And as far as I know, I, was, I believe is true, but I'm not sure about African and Asian. And even if you go back really far, European religions um, respect life and believe that there's no demarcation. In the Sioux language, they say um, what's translated in the English from the Lakota, the Nakota, and Dakota, all my relations, meaning everybody from the buffalo to the leaf. So, yes, and somebody told me, I am not sure I don't have this research, that when in the Old Testament it says, God said to man, I've uh, given you dominion over everything. It doesn't mean I've given you the right to destroy everything, but I've given you the power 
to be the caretakers. And that's what dominion really, or the word that was in the original language of the Bible, it meant caretakers. Thank you. Anthony, you're on mute. I'm going to be quick because I need to jump off this call, but uh, Jill and I just visited the Humane Society here in Pasadena. Fabulous facility. They take such good care of animals. And one of the things we were told, and I'd known this before, is that the Humane Society was founded before uh, Child Protective Services. Um, uh, people were, were concerned about the mistreatment of animals because animals were regarded as the possessions. <clears throat> they were owned by people, and therefore people could do whatever they wanted with them. Well, children were also regarded as possessions, and parents could do whatever they wanted to their children. But this ethical understanding changed <clears throat> after the you know, humane societies were formed. So I, I believe strongly that the way we treat animals reflects the way we treat people. And if we treat animals cruelly or simply for our personal profit, we tend to treat people the same way. So I don't really separate ethics, you know, the ethical treatment of animals and the ethical treatment of people. I think they're inter integrally related. And I just wanted to share that and I have to go, but I uh, wonder if you have a comment about that before I leave. No, actually, um, those, those are really good comments and I don't have much to say in response. Let's never forget there was a time when uh, people were property uh, uh, and, and had no rights. So I think if the arc of history bends toward justice, uh, we are incrementally moving past uh, this uh, property oriented sense of, of uh, uh, values uh, to a more humane, uh, although humane uh, has the word human in it. Um, uh, so I, I like your non-human animal reference. Uh, Dean, we have a few minutes for you to uh, uh, give any concluding thoughts. Well, just maybe touch on a couple other topics and issues um, that are in the book and relevant for this. Um, w one of them is that our human nature is, you know, we, we grew up, you know, starting about 2 million years ago is, is when uh, Homo erectus came about, you know, humans and homo sapiens maybe 200,000 years ago and we invented agriculture something like i don't know 15,000 years ago so for 99.9% .9 of our time on on earth we were hunter gatherers we were basically living in little nomadic groups um not raising food via agriculture but finding food foraging and hunting um, you know, whatever we berries we find in the forest, whatever deer we can kill and bring back, that's what we eat. And of course, that kept our numbers small. I mean, it makes us a lot like other predators, that, that whole mode of, of being. But that's what that whole 99% of our time on Earth has formed our, evolu our, our psychology. You know, it's a subject of, called evolutionary psychology. But the, a lot of those the, the things that were necessary for us as hunter gatherers, like tribalism, you know, our little group is the group and we are opposing other people and sort of short-term thinking. The, the main thing is what's happening right now. Are we going to get enough food this afternoon? Um, that's what we're focused on. And that's the psychology that hinders us um, dealing well with climate, climate change. We're just not psychologically set up. So what, I think we have a duty to do as good humans and citizens um, is to try to overcome those things, try to make ourselves um, more oriented towards the bigger picture. You know, we should be looking out for everybody else on earth, not just our little tribe, you know, not just our family, not just the U S um, but we should be taking everybody into account. And, and we also should be willing to think longer term, uh, 
you know, we need to think about what's going to, what things are going to be like in a thousand years. Well, Dean, thank you so much. We're immensely grateful to you. Uh, I want to say, as I say to many speakers, you are now a card-carrying member of <laughs> ICUJP. Okay. Uh, Rick, Rick will add you to our mailing list any Friday morning. That if you're not in court or fighting <laughs> for the environment, uh, please join us. Okay. Uh, and we're thank we're you. so grateful for the work you do every day. Uh, we wish you the best on your book. There's a link uh, in the chat of where to find it, uh, and we appreciate it. Let me turn to uh, Jasmine for her reflection. Go right ahead. The quote from uh, Wangari Mathai, uh, mm -hmm. no matter how dark the cloud, there is always a thin silver lining that we must look for. The silver lining will come, if not to us, then to the next generation or the generation after that. And maybe with that generation, the lining will be no longer thin. And just we were talking about, you know, how we have to think seven generations and how we, how our um, impact just, you know, we all we all make an impact, and we we just have to be aware and conscious of what what we're doing with our our planet. So that's my reflection. Wonderful, Jasmine. So appropriate for today's conversation and wrapping us up. Uh, I do want to open space for uh, announcements. Uh, any announcements from any of our affiliated organizations or otherwise? Yes. Yes. Sophia. Uh, yeah, just that um, those of you who know, there was a lawsuit filed against the Board of Supervisors um, regarding the 5G towers um, and the non-public notice. Well, we I went this week to the Board of Supervisors and told them that once again, these multinational corporations are coming into our community with no permit um, and setting up towers. And so... Um, be on the lookout for them and you know I call the police and stuff like that but you know they, 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 they're running them up and they can do whatever they want and um, also I thought it was important for everyone to know that the supervisors voted on um, dealing with uh, dispensaries in unincorporated areas um, and it, it's supposed to go to those communities the funds the tax uh, for those that have been you know wrongly convicted or have dealt with the war on drugs and how cannabis has impacted black and brown communities. Um, I went to the first meeting that took place and when, and don't always believe what you read. When I looked at how they were setting it up, it, it's not gonna impact us. Most of the money, the way they wanted to do it was they wanted to do it and model it after the way the city does it. And it's controlled by all white males and it's all organized crime. And I was shocked that they even wanted to propose the same model. Um, so just keep your eyes out um, because uh, the devil's in the details when they're trying to deal with, you know, helping those communities that have been impacted the way the funding is. They'll give the communities pennies, and but the permits are going to go to very wealthy people who can, you know, rig the system and spend a hundred thousand dollars and turn a bunch of um, applications in to get that one permit. And so, you know, we, we want to make sure that if there is a, any type of, of justice that the, the system be created as a co-op in black and brown communities and that the, the black and brown communities own those permits and cultivate within their own areas. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol Francis for announcements. Yes, um, for <clears throat> first, April 1st, uh, this is a very unpolitical thing, but um, the Maker Fair at the LA County, a LA City Library, our downtown library, is having a Maker Fair, and I'm participating. I'm going to be at a table teaching people how to draw in perspective. So it should be fun. It's a whole bunch of activities, a lot of them being. Um, hands-on, interactive. Mine will definitely be because I invented this little 
what I call my uh, perspective drawing learning machine to show people how to draw in perspective. That's April 1st, April Fool's Day, first day of next month. Uh, the second one is April 9th, which I've said this every year, is Paul Robeson's birthday. And this year I decided I'm really, it's the last year for a while where Robeson's birthday will fall on a weekend. So it's this weekend, this year or not. And I just started calling people artists and, and musicians. And I finally got somebody who was performing at the UTLA SEIU rally, who was fantastic, mostly African-American. And they said, yes, I'd like to participate. So that will be a Paul Robeson star on um, April 9th at 6660 in between the uh, Hollywood and Vine and the Hollywood and Highland um, train stations. Thank you. Maggie. I see Phil's hand up and I think we're both wanting to announce the same thing. Uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock, there will be a gathering at the um, Quaker Meeting House in Pasadena, Orange Grove, pa Quaker meeting. And uh, Del and I and a whole group of people, about five of us are going to be playing uh, El Salvador songs that Fidel has written. So we've been practicing it and there are going to be documentaries and speeches and other musical groups. Do you have anything to add, Phil, to the program tomorrow at the Friends Meeting House? Is it? Uh, yeah, thank you, Maggie. Can you give the address too? The address is 520 East Orange Grove Boulevard, Pasadena. Uh, I would just like to, to add a little more about the context of the event. Uh, it's a kind of an annual celebration of the lives and impact of religious martyrs from the Salvadorian Civil War, uh, notably Monsignor Oscar Romero and Rotilio Grande. Uh, with a small town priest who were assassinated around 1990 by government forces because they were too outspoken about the social issues. Um, and our friend Fidel has been celebrating this with the uh, Salvadorian diaspora for years. And I got involved with it a few years back. Uh, and so just like to call your attention to it, um, it's uh, going to be happening tomorrow where I am uh, at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Maggie, for bringing it up. At, at, what, at what time did you say? 10 o'clock. 10, okay. And and the address, until the afternoon, and there will be food. Food. And lots the address, of food. <laughs> the address is in the chat. Good luck oh. with that, guys. Hope anyone uh, close by or near can uh, attend. Uh, Vida. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Reverend James Lawson will be holding his nonviolent workshop tomorrow virtually from Holman United Methodist Church. And uh, it's at 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 to 11. Uh, Ruby, an announcement? No, I didn't take my hand down. I'm oh, going to. Yeah. And uh, fair warning uh, for a prayer at the end, Ruby. Okay, we'll do. And be to get at seeing you. Uh, my announcements are the week of uh, May 3rd and 4th will be a busy week. May 3rd is International Press Freedom Day. Mm. Uh, and Carol Francis and uh, others on the Assange Defense Committee will be uh, recognizing International Peace, International Press uh, Freedom Day with picketing at the corner of Hollywood and Vine and a die-in act of civil disobedience at that intersection. Uh, details of timing will come out and you'll be fully notified. 
Uh, and the next day, May 4, is the Death Penalty Focus uh, Annual Fundraising Dinner at the Skirball uh, Center in Los Angeles at Mulholland. Uh, you'll also be getting detailed information on that with the honorees and the other details. So um, that's the first time in two years that, or three years essentially, that DPF will return to its live annual event. I thank everybody for your participation today. Maggie, your hand is up, but I assume you spoke. Uh, now we calm ourselves and bring ourselves into a virtual circle uh, as we did when we were able to meet personally, uh, really as an opportunity to lift people up, friends, family, colleagues, and others who uh, need a good word at this time. As we take this time, let's just take a breath right now together and know that this breath that we're taking together is the unity mm -hmm. of the world of all colors, nationalities, religions, non-religions, or whatever it is that we call it. It brought us together at this moment, second of eon of time. So a breath together. Um, I just like to comment about the fact that this uh, uh, COVID virus thing is still with us with some somewhat different forms. It finally attacked my immediate family. My daughter and her husband in Phoenix both were uh, infected with the virus for this last week. Mm -hmm. And this has been happening more and more within my circle of family and friends. Um, it's taken a new form. It's attacking vaccinated relatively compliant people, but with a smaller, smaller impact, smaller physical impact. But it is definitely still with us. And uh, I, you know, my, um, what do I want to say? Uh, I suppose this is happening with everybody with mm -hmm. some level. And I just wanted to lift it up. Thank you. Thank you. Other folks coming into this space? Well, then let's turn back to Ruby to send us off for the week ahead. And this is sending us, just even though we're going off and we're from each other at this moment, but each and everything has been spoken. It's still in the universe. It's still in with each and one of us that we can pass on for the successful resolution and completion of whatever it is to, for this earth, for this time to be worked through. And this includes the teachings of the children, of the future, of us working together in countries and knowing what is important to support this planet. And I'm grateful to be a part of this work that we're doing, that we're taking back to our communities and coming together to support this work. I'm grateful right now that I can give it to a divine power that will work through all that it is created. I'm grateful for the speaker who has spoken and who has, be, who has given us a new enlightenment on what it is that each one of us can do individually and go forward in the light and the love and the work. And as I know this and accept this, I give it all up in thanksgiving and prayer. And so it is, as I'm grateful for the healings too that Phil has spoken about. And I'm grateful for Vita coming back and for, with all of her thoughts and actions. And as I know this, I just give it all up for things that haven't been spoken in thanksgiving and prayer. And so it is. Ashe, amen. 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 Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, uh, Dean, very much for your presentation. This is recorded uh, and we'll be pushing it out for others to watch and learn. Uh, thanks, Jasmine, for your wonderful uh, reflection. 
Thanks to everyone. And Rick, would you uh, highlight what uh, next Friday's program uh, will be, if you're still there behind your camera? <laughs> Sorry, I got pulled into another call. Um, yes, uh, we are having um uh jose was i'm sorry denise duffield from the physicians for social responsibility mm. will be speaking so i hope all of you can make it and yes uh, yeah that'd be great wonderful partner uh, with us over the years so uh be well take to heart what ruby had to say be safe as phil reminds us i heard of other friends and Los Angeles went to dinner and contracted COVID. So be safe, be careful, be kind, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.